what I'm going to do is give you uh, uh, just a quick 10 minute uh, overview of how GovHack went on the weekend as a, as a bit of a presentation. And then we shall be uh, switching to our final speaker before morning tea. So uh, anyone that's standing up the back, there's still some seats, not many now, but down the front, so please feel free to come down. Uh, so, Gov, and, and the other thing is that with the, uh, the deliberations, uh, please do use the hash GovCamp uh, Twitter uh, hashtag uh, to, to, to give us your thoughts, to give us your feedback, to give uh, your ideas on some of the, the um, stuff that's coming up throughout all the presentations throughout the day. There is, of course, also the uh, um, online environment that's set up that there's instructions written on the walls on the yellow wall over there or the white walls in the teal room that uh, we encourage you to check out. So GovHack was a, uh, an event on the weekend. It's a 48 hour hack fest. Does anyone not know what a hack fest is? Feel free to put your hand up. Cool, yep. So what a hack fest is, it it's uses that dirty word hack that a lot of people assume to mean that we break into things, but that's not what it actually means at all. It refers to hacker culture from the 60s and 70s, which is all about being clever and creative and curious about technology and how we can apply programming, how can we, we can apply technology to new and interesting things. So a hack fest or gov hack is all about um, making an, uh, new and interesting things, showing off your skills, getting the technical community together to do some fun stuff. And believe it or not, for us geeks, it is actually fun to spend 48 hours programming something. Um, but what happened was over 48 hours, we had 1,000 participants, about 700 of whom were developer, sort of user experience people, were actual um, participants. Uh, storytellers and, and music people and all kinds of different sorts of people and then another 300 that were mentors and supporters and observers so about a thousand people over the weekend in eight cities across Australia uh, got together to make 130 working programs uh, we did voting over three days and we've actually got all the winners that are being announced this afternoon but I uh, thought I'd, I'd, I'd just show you a couple of interesting ones but the whole point of GovHack, as opposed to a normal sort of uh, hack fest or developer sort of event, is that uh, we specifically focus on open um, government data. So, for instance, uh, a lot of people went to uh, look at uh, information. A lot of the, uh, I think we had a dozen federal departments and agencies involved, and five state and territory uh, governments, and about half a dozen local governments involved. So everyone went in and opened up a whole bunch of new data, and uh, and then there were a whole um, about. I think 40 or, or 45 national prizes to go for, and then there were another uh, 40 or so uh, local prizes to go for. So people could look at different data sets, then they could compete for different prizes, and there was $170,000 in prize funding across Australia uh, to bid for, and across the four themes of open government, digital humanities, science, and data journalism, which we thought to be fairly useful uh, uh, themes for the moment. So I just thought I'd show you just a couple. Uh, <laughs> Come check out this really cool spreadsheet of government data. Spreadsheet? Why don't I just put up some Ace of Bakes and we can boot up Windows 95? Ha ha. Very funny. This data is really important. Look man, 2013, I'm too busy owning noobs and to worry about just a bunch of numbers. <sighs> it's really hard to relate to data. Data visualisation is about uh, presenting numbers, essentially, in a more abstract way that's aesthetically pleasing and um, probably more engaging to people than a spreadsheet. Um, what we've decided to work on is a 3D visualisation, kind of inspired by the uh, Oculus Rift headset, um, but it would also work in a normal browser. And we see a couple of main potential applications for it. Uh, one of them is, say, in an education setting, and that's probably the best setting for, uh, for an actual virtual reality type experience. And the other is for data journalism. And uh, that would be probably the normal browser view. It can be embedded in a blog article, that sort of thing. Since we've only had a short amount of time, we picked one way that we thought people can relate to dollar values, um, and that's with sizes of buildings. Um, and roughly kind of show that, say, here's a building, that would equal three million bucks. Um, and then have other valleys which have been represented by a bigger building. Um, so that might be like a you know, $500 million building or a billion dollar building or what have you. Um, 
So the way we tried to do that is by using virtual reality. So it actually puts you um, in amongst buildings of these sizes um, at kind of um, your normal level. So you actually can look up and kind of go, wow, that's a massive building. That's worth, that must be worth so much. But the idea is to have a fairly agnostic framework with a bunch of uh, default models and you can plug in the data set that you want to work with pick the model that you think will work best for it and I'll just stop that one there. So one of the points of the weekend was that every team had 48 hours as I said but as part of their hack as we use the term uh, they had to make a, a three minute video so it was kind of useful because now what we've got is this website with uh, 100, over 100, over 110 or so different um, uh, projects all up and ready to go look at. So I'd highly recommend you go and check some of them out. I'll just play a couple more quick ones and then we shall move on to our final speaker before morning tea. Hi, my name's Adam Scott. I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks. Uh, the data set that caught our eye was the underlying causes of death uh, from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Looking at it, we, uh, we realised that we had a pretty skewed understanding of what actually kills people. So uh, we built a website to improve our understanding of this data set, but also hopefully people at large. Um, the website itself is built using Ruby and is hosted on Heroku. Um, we built it using a variety of Ruby libraries, uh, including Sinatra, uh, Howl, and Active Record. Uh, however, our biggest challenge wasn't a technical one. Um, making a potentially dry data set such as this one actually engaging meant we had to ask really engaging questions, not only focusing on uh, pure numbers of people killed by a certain cause, but also things like uh, what were the potential uh, number of years lost to society by those deaths. Mm -hmm. Dogs are the deadliest, man. What are you talking about? Yeah, sharks are just so big. Whenever you're in the water, you're always so scared. They've just got so many razor sharp rows of teeth. I've seen dogs in my neighborhood. I've never seen a real shark. Wait a second, guys. There's a better answer. What? Right here on your phone. Oh! Deathmatch.me. <laughs> See, dogs are more deadly than sharks. Oh, oh wow. Well, wow. sorry, man. Guess you were right. It's okay. <laughs> Death match on me. So there was actually some very well-made videos and well-made little projects. Um, they ranged from, uh, as I said, those four categories, open government, uh, digital humanities, science, and data journalism. And there were some really beautiful ones that were made um, as part of that, because there was a bit of a theme of beautiful data, particularly in the Melbourne uh, event. So uh, I will just show maybe just one more. Um, I might show this one. We're Team Atomic 51. Yeah, my name's Glenn. I'm the uh, software engineer of the team. And I'm the user experience designer. And we've made a thing we're calling AIR, which is Australia in Review. What we've done is take a whole bunch of different data sets. We've used Australian Bureau of Statistics, we've used financial data, we've used Trove, National Archives, and we've just mashed it all together to create a big visual data visualisation that's all in context. Um, so you can get a real snapshot of what life was like in Australia for the last 40 years. One of the coolest parts about this infographic is that it's dynamic. You are, as a user, you get to select a different point in Australia's history up to 40 years ago and sort of see, like Brad was saying, a snapshot of what Australia was like at that time. The other cool thing it does is you, you can compare dates. So if you look at 1973 and you want to compare what life was like and what, people, what jobs people did, what people earned, all that sort of stuff, and then you can go to select, say, 2010, you can see how the shift, so the different, uh, where the budget was spent, who was in power and politics, um, quality of life, all that sort of stuff. It's all animated, lots of usability, very accessible. We've even included an API of all our post-processed data that we've uh, collated from all the different data centers and sources. Yep, you can download that in JSON. <laughs> It just gives you a little bit of a taste. So uh, I think that uh, the reason we wanted to present some of these to you today was uh, it does sort of start challenging the concept about, about innovation. And the fact is that in Australia, and not, it's not necessarily entirely obvious all the time, but we have um, some of the, the 
best world leading sort of developer communities here in Australia. And uh, a lot of those people and a lot of that community gets uh, overlooked quite often and you see a lot of the tech community in Australia quite often go overseas, which is a huge pity. Uh, if we actually started to prioritise understanding the value of technology and of technical skills and of, of geeks everywhere um, and started to pull them into our strategic development rather than just getting it to the end of the strategy then handing it over for implementation. If you start seeing technical expertise and technology um, now as being a, an integral part of being able to get a good strategy, then you can actually get a better strategy. Um, Geeks can help you in a number of ways, but uh, not least of all, it uh, gives you an idea of what's possible, of uh, some of the risks that you'll face. It'll give you an understanding of new types of data that you can collect, of new types of ways of doing things that you may not have even thought of before. Um, how many of you are putting in place a mobile strategy at the moment for your organizations or departments? A few of you. How many of you already have a mobile strategy? All right, so I'm going to deduce that most of you don't have a mobile strategy then. There's a bunch of people putting in place mobile strategy, but then there's a question about, well, what about augmented reality? What about embedded computing? Have you heard of embedded computing? No. So a friend of mine, because, um, you know, I'm a geek, has um, an embedded RFID chip in his arm. So it's just this tiny little chip, RFID. And uh, so he doesn't... So he uses that to unlock and to start his car, to open his house, to use all of his security encryption on his uh, computer. Uh, he doesn't actually carry any keys anymore. Uh, he doesn't need to. Um, there's a lot of those kinds of examples. Uh, another friend had a, um, embedded a tiny little ball on the tip of her finger. This is the last story, but it was a tiny little um, uh, sphere, and it, the sphere was filled with mercury and with a tiny free-floating magnet. A tiny free-floating magnet. So when you have a free-floating magnet in Mercury, it, it can spin, of course. So what would happen would be that the magnet would spin according to the frequency of whatever network she was in at that point in time. So she could actually detect when her computer was spinning up or spinning down, these kinds of things. Here's the fascinating thing. Her, com her body, her neurological system, adapted to a new foreign input. She was able to actually detect accurately, after a little while of having this thing embedded, um, uh, the difference between, you know, the different speeds of when the magnet was spinning. So that to me indicates that we have a, a very brave new world ahead of us where we can actually start to get some fascinating things. I actually foresee a future in the not too distant future where the Paralympics becomes the main event and becomes the more interesting one. So uh, we're, and we're very, very close. 3D printing, um, nanotechnology, there's a lot of stuff in just the next 10 years is going to fundamentally change society. So unless we look at what that means from an innovation perspective, unless government in particular actually keeps our finger on the pulse of what's going on out there publicly and actually get engaged with the technocracy, as shall we call it. And um, unless we do that, then we're going to miss out on these opportunities and we're going to deliver services that are out of date before we even get them out the door. So there's some of my thoughts. What I'm going to do is welcome our last speaker.